Chapter Fifteen of the War Chiefs of the Six Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lawrence. The War Chief of the Six Nations by Lewis Aubrey Wood. Chapter Fifteen: The Pine Tree Totters. It came to pass before long that the Indians wished to dispose of some of the land granted to them on Grand River. The United Empire Loyalists and others, lured by the prospect of cheap land, kept crossing into Canada from the United States. Accessions to the population of the Great Lakes region had come by immigration from the British Isles, and the country was making forward strides. Straggling settlers and speculators were often anxious to purchase land in the richer districts when they could get it at a low price. It happened, however, that after the Redskins had sold and leased bits of their territory to such persons, the provincial government began to interfere. The land, it said, belonged to the Indians only so long as they remained upon it. They could not, therefore, sell any of it, as they had no direct ownership of the soil. This decision shed a new light upon the propriety rights of the Six Nations in Canada, and the Indians were sorely perplexed. All along they thought that they held their lands like other settlers who had proved their loyalty. Brant vigorously took up their case, made several able speeches on their behalf, and freely corresponded with the authorities of the province regarding the matter. In 1793 Governor Simcoe issued a new proclamation respecting the grant, but this did not end the dispute. The province still claimed the right of preemption with respect to the whole of their reserve. Later on the matter was carried to England, and the British government tended to favor the Indians' claims, but nothing was done owing to contentions among the Redskins themselves. It was only, indeed, after Brant's death that the affair was finally settled. The sale of large tracts of Indian land was then authorized and the money received was safely invested for the benefit of the Mohawks and others of the Six Nations in Canada. In connection with this difficult question, Brant had intended making a trip to England, but was forced to abandon the idea. During the latter part of his life, Brant visited different parts of America and twice journeyed as far as the Atlantic seaboard. On these occasions he had the opportunity of talking over old campaigns with officers who had fought against him in the war, and he delighted his listeners with stirring stories of his experiences in the field. On one occasion, when in Philadelphia, he was entertained in sumptuous fashion by Colonel Aaron Burr. A dinner party was held in his honor, and among the guests were Talleyrand and Volney. Early in the evening the war chief was rather taciturn, and the other guests were somewhat disappointed. But this was only a passing mood, from which Brant soon freed himself, launching into the conversation he was soon the center of attraction. Though Captain Brant was able to pass his later years in comparative ease, his life was marred by the occurrence of two untoward events. His eldest son Isaac was a reprobate over whom the father exercised little influence. Isaac had been guilty of acts of violence and had begun to threaten Joseph Brant himself. He was jealous of the numerous children of Catherine Brant and took occasion to offer her various insults. In 1795, both father and son were at Burlington Heights at a time when the Indians were receiving supplies from the provincial government. Isaac, crazed with liquor, tried to assault his father in one of the lower rooms of an inn, but was held in check by several of his youthful companions. Captain Brant drew a dirk which he usually carried with him, and, in the excitement of the moment, inflicted a slight wound on Isaac's hand. The cut was not serious but Isaac would not allow it to be properly treated, and subsequently died from an attack of brain fever. The war chief was sorely grieved at the result of his hasty action, and fretted about it until the end of his days. He is said to have hung the dirk up in his room, and to have often wept as he gazed upon it. The other source of trouble to Brant was the revolt against his rule of a small minority among the tribes. This movement was led by Brant's old adversary, Red Jacket, and another chief, the farmer's brother. A council was held by the dissenters at Buffalo Creek in 1803, and Joseph Brant was formally deposed as head of the Confederacy of the Six Nations. But as this meeting had not been legally convoked, its decisions were of no validity among the nations. 
the following year at another council legitimately assembled the tribesmen openly declared their confidence in the war chief's rule because of brant's many services to the crown the british government gave him a fine stretch of land on the northwest shore of lake ontario near the entrance to burlington bay on his estate known as wellington square he erected a large two-story house in which he might spend the remaining years of his life a number of black slaves whom he had captured in the war were his servants and gave him every attention brant is said to have subjected these negroes to a rigid discipline and to have been more or less of a taskmaster in his treatment of them in his declining years he was wont to gaze over the waters of lake ontario remembering the country stretching from the southern shore where once he had struggled and the valley of the mohawk where had been the lodges of his people but the giant pine tree of the forest was now beginning to bend tall and erect it had outtopped and outrivaled every other tree of the woodland men knew that the pine tree was tottering in the autumn of eighteen o seven the captain of the six nations was in the grip of a serious illness friends and neighbors came to bring solace and comfort for he was widely revered racked with pain but uncomplaining he passed the few weary hours of life which were left on november twenty four eighteen o seven the long trail came to an end close by brant's bedside john norton footnote norton was a scotsman who coming to canada early in life settled among the mohawks and won a chief's rank among them he played an important part in the war of eighteen twelve end footnote john norton a chieftain of his tribe leaned to catch the last faltering word have pity on the poor indians whispered the dying war chief if you can get any influence with the great endeavor to do them all the good you can the body of captain brant was taken to grand river and buried beside the walls of the church he had helped to rear in the center of the busy city of brantford whose name as well as that of the county commemorates his stands a beautiful monument picturesque and massive to his worth and valor in the hearts of the people of canada he is enshrined as a loyal subject a man of noble action and a dauntless hero seldom in the annals of canada do we find a character so many-sided as the captain of the mohawks he was a child of nature and she endowed him with many gifts a stout and hardy frame a deportment pleasing and attractive and an eloquent tongue it was these natural endowments that gave him endurance in the conflict preeminence in council and that won for him the admiration of his contemporaries the education which brant received was meager but he could hardly have put what knowledge he had to better advantage after he had been relieved from the arduous life of the camp he had begun to satisfy again his desires for self-culture his correspondence toward the close of his life showed a marked improvement in style over that of his earlier years there was no lack of convincing evidence that brant had a penetrating and well-balanced intellect but his chief glory is the constant efforts he put forth for the moral and religious uplift of his people with respect to brant's abilities as a military leader there will continue to exist differences of opinion that he possessed the craftiness of his race in a superlative degree and that he used this to baffle his opponents on the field of battle cannot be denied some will go further and assert that he had a remarkable genius in the art of stratagem whatever powers he had he used from his boyhood days in the interest of british rule in america and the services rendered by this last great leader of the six nations in the war of the revolution were not among the least of the influences that enabled great britain to maintain a foothold on the north american continent joseph brant in the war of the revolution and his descendants in the war of eighteen twelve played essential parts in firmly basing british institutions and british rule in canada end of chapter fifteen recording by david lawrence january twenty four two thousand and nine in brampton ontario end of the war chief of the six nations